Hello everyone, we've talked a lot on this channel about how evolution is used to understand the past, but today we're going to talk about how evolution can be used to predict the future. So let's jump right in. <laughs> As we've mentioned on this channel before, the hallmark of a good theory is its ability to make predictions. Anyone can make up an ad hoc rationalization to explain away data that contradicts a particular model, but not every model can be used to make accurate predictions about future data. If the evolution of all organisms from a set of common ancestors is true, then we should be able to test that. As it happens, we can. We can test it in numerous ways, with morphology, ecology, biogeography, genetics, and with fossils. So let's take some examples. Darwin himself provided numerous predictions. One of the most famous was the prediction of a pollinating insect that possessed a proboscis with an absurd length that could reach down inside the flower of a peculiar species of orchid from Madagascar that held its nectar deep inside a long tube. This insect was eventually found, a moth called Xanthopan. Darwin also observed that the bones inside the wings of birds looked like they were fingers that got fused together. So he predicted that a fossil of an ancient bird with separate fingers would be found one day. This ended up being Archaeopteryx. The first specimen was discovered just two years after the publication of Darwin's book On the Origin of Species. But the evolutionary predictions didn't end there. An example of a modern prediction of evolution is one we have discussed at length, the chromosome 2 fusion, including all its details such as the telomeric repeats at the fusion site, two centromeres, one of which is deactivated, as well as the conserved centony between chromosome 2 and the two that remain separate in the other great apes, which can only be predicted based on common descent. Not only was the fusion predicted, but creationists have been completely unable to refute it, but since we already made a video about that, we're going to leave it there. The prevalence of mutations in organisms even allows researchers to make predictions about their prevalence in populations. For example, there are different types of mutations, such as mutations from guanine to thymine or from cytosine to adenine, etc. These mutations occur at different rates in the human population, so are found at different frequencies. Using these frequencies, we can generate a graph like this, showing the signature of mutations. If mutations were also the cause of interspecies genetic differences, then we would predict a similar spectrum graph when counting up the different types of nucleotide differences between humans and chimps. And we do. In fact, the spectrum also matches when you look at the differences between humans and more distantly related apes like gorillas and orangutans, and matches when comparing differences between those other apes such as chimps and gorillas. This makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model. Under creationism, it implies that a creator created interspecies DNA differences that just so happened to look exactly as though they had occurred by the same natural processes that give rise to within-species differences. It also makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model why genetic sequences for homologous proteins converge the further you go back in time, which was, by the way, also predicted under evolution. When we reconstruct ancestral sequences from different groups of species, we find that those ancestral sequences are more similar to one another than the descendant species, implying a branching pattern of divergence that fits the evolutionary model of common descent perfectly. Researchers also sometimes make predictions about specific genetic homologies in organisms. Michael Coates wrote the 2003 The Evolution of Paired Fins when he specifically notes the homologies between scapulocoracoid or pectoral fin cartilage and certain branchial or gill arch cartilage. His abstract ends with this, quote, No transformation of arch to girdle is necessarily implied, but some signal of developmental relatedness is predicted, close quote. And, sure enough, the 2009 paper, Shared Developmental Mechanisms Pattern the Vertebrate Gill Arch and Paired Fin Skeletons by Gillis, Don, and Shubin, found, quote, The molecular patterning of chondrichthyan branchial rays, gill rays, and reveal profound developmental similarities between gill rays and vertebrate appendages, close quote. Another example of a very precise prediction concerns our yoke, or rather lack thereof. 
As all amniotes, our embryonic development is typified by the formation of several membranes, among them the amnion, hence the name. These membranes retain the moisture for the embryo, which allowed amniotes to invade dry land. Most amniotes lay eggs that contains a massive yolk sac filled with nutrients, which allowed for the development to be more complete before birth, without the need for a post-birth metamorphosis stage as is the case with amphibians. Egg laying is the ancestral reproductive state of amniotes, and there are still a few mammals around that do this, like the monotremes. However, eutherian mammals like us have a placenta that made the yolk sac obsolete, but curiously we still have a vestigial yolk sac that doesn't have any yolk in it. All of this points to the conclusion that our ancestors once laid eggs containing a yolk sac filled with yolk. And yolk is mostly protein coated by genes. So if eutherians are descended from amniotes that once laid eggs with yolk, we should expect to see leftovers of these genes in our genome, and we do. They are broken, but they are still there, and when compared to their functional homologs and other amniotes, they also have the same neighboring genes. This is called shared centony, which is also a predicted phenomenon as a direct consequence of common descent. Aside from genetic predictions, evolution also makes fossil predictions. First, Robert Broom predicted the existence of an amniote with a double hinged jaw joint based on the idea that mammals evolved from the colloquially called reptiles. The jaw joint of ancestral amniotes is formed by the articulation between the articular and quadrate bones, while that of mammals is between the dentary and squamosal. Broom deduced that the only plausible way for this transition to have happened is that, at one point, both jaw joints were together at the same time, and this was discovered decades later in Probane Ignathus and a whole host of other near-mammal fossils. William Beebe predicted that birds should have gone through a stage in their evolution where they had asymmetrical flight feathers on their front and back legs. He predicted this by the fact that Archaeopteryx had sparse flight feathers on its hind legs, which weren't enough to be useful for flight, so he thought they were vestigial, indicating that an ancestral stage with bigger feathers on the hind limbs existed. This was found in the form of Microraptor. Also in relation to birds, a feather morphotype was predicted by embryological data and later found in dinosaurs, such as Bipiosaurus. Paleontologists predicted an ant fossil that had features of wasps in the Cretaceous and that was confirmed as Sphecomirma. Neil Shubin and colleagues predicted a fish-like tetrapod or tetrapod-like fish, and at that stage would there be much difference, in Devonian strata of Canada, and that was confirmed as tiktalic. Researchers long predicted the existence of sauropods in the Triassic, and that was confirmed as Isanosaurus from Thailand. Recently, a semi-aquatic whale ancestor was found named Paragocetus. This cetacean has a flattened tail like a beaver, which was useful for propelling it through the water. It also showed how the earliest marine whales migrated from their place of origin near India to the Americas. Later whales, such as Basilosaurus, had tail flukes, while earlier whales, such as Pachycetus, had thinner tails that would not have been especially useful for swimming. Paragocetus fits in directly between these with the tail shape predicted by researchers. The list goes on, but the point is that there's no reason for these predictions to have been fulfilled if different clades of organisms were created separately from each other, as imagined both in the flood geology and intelligent design models. Then there's biogeography. Geologists have worked out that the crust of the Earth has changed much throughout its history and organisms have had to adapt to it. Regarding this, researchers correctly predicted that fossil marsupials would be found specifically in Eocene strata in Antarctica since they moved from South America to Australia at a time when these land masses were connected by Antarctica. The same is true for many dinosaurs and plants predicted for even earlier times based on what was alive in the then adjacent land masses of the Mesozoic. So what does all of this mean? It means that evolution works. It makes accurate, specific predictions about what should be found both in the fossil record and our own genomes. To quote young earth creationist Todd Wood, quote, Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It is not teetering on the verge of collapse. It has not failed as a scientific explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it, close quote. Or, to quote young earth creationist Kurt Wise, quote, Evolutionary theory suggests that land plants evolved from marine green algae and that land animals evolved from marine fish. The first appearances of fish, amphibians, and reptiles, as well as the position of morphological intermediates between fish and amphibians, are in exactly the order predicted by evolution. Close quote.
Thus, if evolution were supplanted by some new theory, that theory would necessarily have to take into account all of the successful predictions made by evolution. You cannot make a new theory by ignoring valid data from the old one. That old data must be built upon. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.